Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm very excited. We have Lee Euler, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. His first direct mail piece he wrote in 1976. He's the founder of Cancer Defeated, which is dedicated to researching and reporting on alternative cancer treatments and has grown rapidly to become the world's number one source of information about this important subject. And I have to say, Lee, in general to everyone, he writes some of the most compelling emails and subject lines I've ever read. I would suggest sign up for his newsletter just on that fact alone. I can be in productive mode, just, you know, just doing whatever I need to be doing at that moment. And I see one of your emails come through and I almost swear under my breath because I know I have to click on it and see what is in this email. I was reading one the other day, uh, plant boot, just to give people an example, plant boosts cancer killing cells 900%. You can't not click on that, Lee. So thank you for joining me. Well, my pleasure. Um, I always like to include a fun fact. And fun fact, when I asked you, you said, we're talking about the worst job you ever had. What was that? Well, the worst job I ever had was uh, picking up bales of hay in Kansas, where mm-hmm. I grew up. Mm-hmm. Was, uh, so, so tell me about um, growing up. What was a big inspiration, influence for you? What was, uh, what was growing up like? Uh, well, I grew up in a small town in Kansas. It was a farming community, and my, my parents started out as farmers and mm-hmm. then ended up doing other things, uh, but basically working class and farmers, and, mm-hmm. you know, very sturdy people with mm-hmm. a fierce work ethic. Uh, you know, that was, that was the kind of uh, environment I, I grew up in. I mean, I, I would say, I mean, I was working, you know, in my family, mm-hmm. By the time you were five or six years old, your parents were looking at you and saying, haven't you got a job yet? <laughs> so it was just that kind of community. And, and all the kids worked, everybody worked. Yeah. And, and uh, if you didn't have a job during the summer, for example, the neighbors gossiped about you. Really? So, uh, you know, it was just, it, I grew up like that. And uh, so I don't have any problems putting the nose to the grindstone and applying myself to whatever I have to do. What were you doing at five or six? What kind of jobs did you have? Uh, well, my first job was delivering newspapers. My mm-hmm. brother had a newspaper route, mm-hmm. and he would uh, sub out parts of it to other carriers because it was too much for him to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had a little newspaper route when I was about seven years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, it was, I can't believe it. I mean, these days people don't even let a seven-year-old wander <laughs> off you know, by themselves. And it, that, That's how different the world was in the 1950s. I right. Mean, it was safe, you know, in that kind of environment in a small town. I ran all over the place unsupervised, you know, by the time I was five or six. So it was, you know, but no parent would do that. No parent would be arrested now for doing <laughs> that. Let a kid do the stuff we did. What lessons did you learn growing up on the farm that you still use today? Um, well, besides the work ethic, mm-hmm. uh, that, that's the thing that most readily comes to mind. Yeah. Um, I think you learn, you know, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. You show up at 9 o'clock, uh, you know, things like that. Basic, uh, just the basics of, of making a success of, in life. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I just, to me, the most important lesson I learned was that you have a moral obligation to support yourself and not be a burden on other people. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I absorbed that uh, in uh, just by 300%, and, and that's just the kind of guy I am. So when the first time you left the farm, what did you do? Uh, well, I went to a boarding school uh, hmm. for high school, and that was a dramatically different world from what I was what used to. What was that like? Uh, well, the high school in my hometown wasn't very good. The public schools weren't very good. Mm-hmm. So it was uh, you know, going, worth going to a private school, not very far from where I lived, but I still boarded there. Mm-hmm. So it was like summer camp, really. I mean, you know, you, you were away from the parents and hang out with a bunch of guys all the time. Mm-hmm. So I loved it. It was great. I, it's, uh, all these horror stories you hear about boarding school, I, I don't know what people are talking about. <laughs> what did you do after boarding school? I went to college. I, I skipped senior year of high school. I had good grades and high SATs and went to college uh, a year early. And mm-hmm. uh, 
then I sort of didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Suddenly, after you know spending my whole high school years trying to uh, get into a good college, I got into a good college, mm-hmm. and I didn't know what I was going to do next. So there was kind of a period of wandering in the wilderness there uh, and trying to decide what to do. And uh, I was always interested in business and economics mm-hmm. and things like that, so I sort of drifted into that. I guess I had two, two interests. One was writing and being a writer, mm-hmm. and uh, the other was just in business and economics. That, I um, I wanted like everybody at the age of twenty. Uh, I wanted to write novels and be a, that kind of writer. You did, but okay. I, I soon I, I realized that I wasn't going to make a living at that, and so I learned about being a journalist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, and from being a journalist, I learned about writing marketing copy. It was sort of like it was, I guess I'm very money motivated. This is going to, going to sound very venal, but first I figured out no one made money writing fiction unless you were mm-hmm. very lucky. So I went to journalism, and then I figured out, well, journalism's nice, but marketing guy, marketing writers mm-hmm. make a lot more money than journalists, so let's write marketing copy. And, and uh, that's sort of how I segued into being a marketing guy. I, I thought the business side of direct response marketing was a lot more fascinating than the journalism side. So, um, you know, I kind of glommed onto that. I thought it was interesting. So when did you first get into, you know, early in your career, marketing? Um, well, that's a good question. I got a job with a small publisher. I, I was living in New York. That's where I went to college. Okay. And I went to Chicago to go to... Okay. That's where I am. School. Oh, you're in Chicago? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I, yeah, I got my MBA at the University of Chicago oh, at right. night. I went to... The reason my motivation for going there was they had a night program, and most quality business oh. schools don't. So I worked on my MBA at night, and I had a job with a small publisher, a small newsletter publisher in Chicago. Okay. Uh, it didn't pay very much to begin with. It was only, the only job I could get. And um, I just sort of, because we were small and there were really only two full-time people and a couple of part-time people, I wore every hat in the office. Hmm. That Good was experience. when I, yeah, that's when I started writing marketing copy. Yeah. Uh, I was hired to write the newsletter and I started writing ads. And I, did that, I just found that side of the business interesting that yeah. you, you send out a letter to people and they send you money back and you analyze <laughs> it. You know, Sounds good. Yeah, did it cost you more to get that money than the letters cost that you sent out? That's kind of the essence of, of direct response marketing. Right. Did the, the, did the revenues exceed the cost of the ad? Yeah. If, if they did, then you're in good shape. And I've never departed from that. And you know, these it's days, simple but effective, right? It's simple but effective. And nowadays, there's a million other stats that you can look at. You know, how many people opened the letter? You know, we didn't know that in direct mail days. Right. You know, in the internet, you know how many people opened your letter. We didn't know. So, um, you know, the really the only stat you had, in a way, was how much money came back mm-hmm. and so, how many the number of orders. Yeah. So, you know, they kind of always stay very focused on that. So what were some of the campaigns? Give me an example of some of the campaigns you're running at that small agency. Uh, Well, this was a a newsletter for uh, corporate PR people Mm -hmm. and people who wrote corporate newsletters. At least at the time, I don't know if it's changed, but every company had a house newsletter or a house magazine. Mm -hmm. Like John Deere Corporation had the John Deere magazine. Yeah, I see. so that's we were advising. Our gotcha. role was advising and consulting with people who had to create these magazines and newsletters and newspapers mm-hmm. that all these companies put out yeah. to uh, hopefully make their employees love them. I don't know if it worked yeah. very well, but you know that was the idea. So you know that's what we were doing. It was house editors and house public relations people, and um, we advised them and, and helped them do their jobs. So the, the, the campaigns were business to business. Yeah, we they were directed at the responsible person in company XYZ who, who put out these publications. Yeah. It was, was, it was an experience. Um, I mean, working in a small shop, I could experiment and do all kinds of right. things. Right, yeah. So what experiments did you find at that time worked or didn't work? Oh, uh, we found out that, I mean, Bill Mees made a big difference. If you didn't ask for cash with order and let companies bill you, mm-hmm. and you almost had to do that in business to business. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had to let people invoice you or you invoice them. Um, so they get to try it, do it. Yeah, the free then, trial offer. Yeah. Offering, you know, I mean, it was really just the basics that now everybody knows. But mm-hmm. in those days, people were still kind of inventing this stuff. Mm-hmm. You give people four free issues. You have you could read the first four issues and cancel if you don't like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I mean, I was probably one of the first people to do that offer. Well, yeah. uh, and it, you get your money back, no obligation. If you're unhappy, you just let us know and you get your money back. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, really, really basic stuff like that. Uh, had, you know, I learned that the teaser copy on the envelope was what got people to open the envelope. Mm. It, it, what it kind of real, teaser copy they were you using? What did you put on there? Oh gosh, I mean, it was pretty much the offer. I think it was you know four free issues uh-huh. of whatever it was, uh, uh, you know, relevant to their their responsibilities at their job. Yeah. What were some other uh, interesting insights you gained, or um, you must have seen some results that really gave you a light bulb to do this? Because you're you're still doing it today. What was one of those campaigns you remember se- seeing the money come in and uh, realizing, I think I'm going to do this? Um, can't remember anything along those lines. I mean, the basics were. Uh, I mean, you're I'm an old guy. This is 40 years ago. You're, tax, you're taxing my memory. <laughs> I've seen videos of you. You're not. You don't look that old. So. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. But I mean, the, the, the basics have remained the same, even though it's internet now. That's direct mail. Yeah. I mean, the most important thing is the the offer. Mm-hmm. How do you craft the offer? Right. What list are you sending it to? Who are, who are these people you're asking? to send you money right and then and then last out of the three is the copy i mean we tend to think that the ad is so terribly important but the ad is actually after the offer and Mm. the list interesting if you're if you're making the right offer to the right group of people yeah you're you're more than two-thirds of the way to success and then then the great ad copy is just uh icing icing on the cake yeah um so it's really the basics you know like i said I mean, we found that like, finding new lists was really important, which is, again, everybody knows this, but it wasn't quite such common knowledge mm-hmm. back in the day. Um, but, you know, whenever you found a new list of people uh, uh, that were responsive to what you were doing, yeah. that, that, that could double your income, just finding the right list. Was it hard to do at that time, to find lists? I mean, because, like you said, how many people were really doing this at that time? Uh, well, for the kind of thing we were doing, uh, we were niche marketing, right. and very, very, very kind of focused uh, marketing. But I mean, if we, for example, found out that you know colleges all had house newsletters, so mm-hmm. and and hospitals all had a house newsletter, so you could do a different ad that was targeted just mm-hmm. at what the hospital people were interested mm-hmm. in, because you know they were they were writing different kinds of articles for their employees compared to what John Deere or General Motors were writing. Mm-hmm. So you know each group was targeted. So you could you could have a targeted uh, kind of uh, ad for the the, the list in the, in the market segment, and that mm-hmm. lifted your response. You might double your response by just targeting hospital people instead of treating all editors as though they were alike. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you know, just things like that, market segmentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I like this theme that you have: offer first, list, and then copy. So what was next after the small direct marketing firm? What what did you do next? Well, I got in uh, what was a, still a small company, but much larger than the one I had been with, and it was called Phillips Publishing. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, they became enormous. I mean, at yeah. the time I joined them, they uh, which was 1979, they were just all excited because they just had their first million dollar year in yeah. sales, and that was pretty. Big. How big are they now? Uh, well, I eventually got to four or five hundred million years yeah. after I left. Yeah. Uh, when I left, they were doing about four million, so I could tell all. When I put out my resume, I could say I quadrupled the sales <laughs> uh, from one million to four million. Uh, and I was the marketing director. I was hired to be the director of marketing. Yeah. So um, already by then, I would kind of left the the journal as a part of it behind. Mm-hmm. Um, so what um, kind of stuff did you do at the time to help? grow that grow the company well one of the things was i i would i made their list research more refined you mm-hmm. know that we made a point of going out looking for new mailing lists mm-hmm. and the market segmentation tactic the four free issues tactic mm-hmm. that i introduced to them mm-hmm. read four issues no obligation you know it's if, if you're not happy you keep them that kind you know having free bonuses giving everybody a bonus report when they subscribe Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, there were a lot of basics that I was able to introduce to these places mm-hmm. that could really double or triple the response. I mean, if you can imagine, I mean, I don't know if, if what kind of thing you do. We haven't talked about that. But 
uh, recently in the internet world, when we went from text landing pages to video sales letters, yeah. those of us who were early doing that mm-hmm. saw a double or triple in the response. It was like, wow. <laughs> um, and a lesson there was, I mean, marketing people all hated video sales letters. I mean, who would sit and listen to someone read a sales pitch to them? Right. We, we all thought they were crazy, but we found out when we, the returns came in, this is what the public loved, and um, you could you could double your your sales in one year with that. So just thing you know things like that it, it can. Why do you think it stuff. doubled? Uh, well, video sales letters are a very interesting subject. I mean, I would say the average marketer with roots in text still hates video sales letters. Right. Uh, I mean, I don't like to listen to them. I, you know, I don't have forty fifty minutes to sit there and listen to one of these right. things. Um, why the public loves them so much? Um, like your list for like your your site. Why do people love them so much? Because you do I have a bunch we, of them. I've I, listened to some. Well, I, we, yeah, they become pretty much standard. I, I think a lot of our audience is older, and they literally don't have anything to do, and they don't have anyone to talk to in the case of my present market for Cancer Defeated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, it may be just nice to sit there, and if you're talking about something that they are deeply, deeply interested in, yeah, like the is, cancer, for example, yeah. If if they have cancer, people will sit all day and listen to it. They'll sit all day and listen yeah. to that, and it's also hypnotic because the text is in front of you. You're watching the words and you're listening to this guy's voice. Hopefully, not falling asleep. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, hope, you know, it's kind of hypnotic. It, it's uh, uh, you kind of are just lulled into an altered state. Mm-hmm. I think when yeah. you're watching these things. Um, now, of course, people do animation and all yeah. kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the early, in the early days, it was just pretty much a PowerPoint just presentation text. with audio. Yeah. Uh, so, but it's it very really, odd. I mean, that that sort of thing doubled the uh, response. From yeah, me. that's amazing. Because with Philips, you were saying you know, you did a bunch of things to help grow, and one of the things you mentioned was the list segmentation or doing um, things with the list. What would you recommend people do today that you? you know, actually employed then and, and still do now as far as the, the list goes? Well, I, I learned something really useful from a great marketer named Pat Gerard, who was one of the best direct mail copywriters ever. I think he's probably not known now because he's gone. I actually have emailed with him a little bit, I, I believe. Is that, is that right? He's still Someone right. recommended him to, uh, to contact. He wow. inter- seems like an interesting guy. I think I'm he pretty is. sure he it's the very, same. I mean, he was legendary. Was he a veteran also? Do you know? No, not to my knowledge. He was okay. Canadian. He was, he was from Canada. So I, I didn't, okay. Not, I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's the same person. But yeah, go on. Yeah, Pat. But as what far as you? list research goes, he said he, he was, uh, uh, I was at Phillips Publishing, and we were buying a real estate newsletter. Mm-hmm. And Gerard started this real estate newsletter that he was no longer interested in doing and how to invest in real estate. Mm-hmm. So we were buying his newsletter, and we were all in his offices in New York and talking with him. And he said, "You know, well, when I was when I was figuring out how to market this newsletter, I went to my competitor's list broker uh, in direct mail. You know, you had list brokers, mm-hmm. and I went to my competitor's list broker and said, I want to know every list that this other guy is using.' Mm-hmm. And list brokers, you know, it's kind of uh, they're not sworn to confidentiality. They mm-hmm. they will." rent lists to whoever, whoever. Wants to, yeah whoever, whoever wants will to pay rent. them yeah whoever will pay them okay. so your 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 competitors list is your best list and and a large part of your intelligence gathering is finding out what list your competitor is using right. if you're running banners now you want to know what websites your 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 uh, your best competitor is running his banners on yeah uh, if you are in the JV business and you're swapping lists with everybody like I do uh, you know, a new JV partner is valuable. You want to know who all the JV partners are. So that's your list research. Right, right. You know, finding a new JV partner is, you know, that makes your day if you're doing the kind of thing I'm doing now in, in the Internet. Yeah. Uh, somebody who has like a hundred or a couple hundred thousand great names and they're willing to exchange with you. Right. Uh, that's, that makes your day. Yeah. That can make your week or even your month. So, um, mm. but you find that out by seeing what your competitors are doing and, and, um, yeah, you know, whenever I get a list for somebody, uh, whenever I get like an email from somebody who's talking about alternative cancer treatment, I mean, my first impulse is I get annoyed because here's another competitor <laughs> who's talking about can- alternative cancer thing. treatment. Yeah. yeah, 
But my next impulse is to email the guy and say, how many names have you got on your list? <laughs> and would you like to exchange with me? So, uh, yeah. I could see that. I could see that that thought process. You know, so how do you get past that or do you always do that or sometimes it's just a direct competitor that you don't necessarily want to do that? Well, a lot of people, when you do approach them and you want to exchange less, well, this happens a lot in the food supplement business, which mm -hmm. I'm also in, mm -hmm. but they'll say, no, you're, I'm not going to mail your offer to my list. I'm not going to exchange with you. You're, you're too competitive with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know what? Mm -hmm. They're stupid. <laughs> Because your, your competitor's mailing list is your best mailing list, and you will both profit. Right. I mean, you know, there are limits to it. You don't want to go crazy letting your competitors, you know, uh, rape your mailing list. Right. And, 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 but, um, but, you know, at some point, you know, you, you, there's a tipping point where, yeah, you want to mail that guy's list, and to get that, you're willing to let him mail your list. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, all these people are, like, so protective of their lists, it's, it's, they're making a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you might want to, you know, what we do is we embargo new names. Uh, when we've just added someone to the list, we want to market to that person for the first 60 days. Or right, whatever. I see. You know, you know and then yes. you open it up and you let If they've been on your list for two years, then you can market to someone with someone else's list as opposed yeah, to someone who just yeah. came that day. Yeah. I got yeah. you. That's smart. Well, another important thing with, is hotline names are really important. I mean, you want to find out who your when your competitor is growing rapidly. I mean, again, my first impulse is I hate this guy; he's growing faster. Than me. <laughs> right. But your next thing is new names. New names are more valuable than old names, and this was true in direct mail, and mm -hmm. it's true mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah. So, uh, so whenever, you know, you want what are called hotline names, the names that were just added, they're the most valuable names. Mm -hmm. So uh, your competitor who's growing fast is really valuable. Um, and, um, you know, you want to get at those people. I mean, your leads, I mean, if you do any lead generation, and we do a little bit of that, I mean, again, the leads decline in value really fast. The day you add a lead is the day when they're most likely to buy something from mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. And then it just declines. The half-life is, is really short. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, uh, you know, and, and the same principle applies to upselling, by extension. Um, the day you're, you know, the minute your customer bought something from you, that's when he's most likely to buy something else from you. Mm -hmm. so that's why everyone piles on upsells. You know, you can tell the good marketers because when you buy something from them, they're just pitching you on upsell after upsell after upsell. Right. So where do you start? Where do you end? Where does the uh, road end with that? You How know? many? Are, are there too right. many upsells? Right. Exactly. Well, I, I, you know, I feel like two or three is the limit. Yeah. You know, I don't. That's. I mean, the, the airlines are do this all the time. I mean, I'm going through 10 upsells when I try and buy a ticket. You know, like, do you want to get this economy or first class? You know, they're just doing it all day long. Well, I think the airlines realize that everybody these days is buying on price. When, mm -hmm. when you're booking a flight, it's mm -hmm. all about, I'm going to take the cheapest flight. I mean, I'm not like that, not anymore. I mean, I'm not going to go on Southwest Airlines and stop at 10 different cities in order to get the cheapest city, the cheapest fare. But there's all, I mean, everyone buys airline tickets based on price mm -hmm, more mm -hmm. than on quality. Mm -hmm. uh, so they realize, okay, we've got him with a $199 fare from here to Sydney, Australia. And then they want to sell you all this other stuff. Right. So they make, make some money out of this. Right. You know, uh, the drinks on the plane are going to be $50, you know, or whatever. <laughs> exactly. So it's upsells all the way because they know that for the basic core sell, no one's going to pay them anything for mm -hmm. it. Um, I mean, in a way, I mean, you're, I'm riffing on this, but maybe they're doing lead generation in a way that the basic fare when you book a flight mm -hmm. is really just a, they've got you as a lead. Yeah. And then it's all about trying to get you to upgrade to first class or check a bag and play, pay $25, you know, whatever right. they're trying to sell you. Yeah. Exactly. What else have you found has worked? You, you said JV lists work really well. Um, what else do you find works really well? Do you still do direct mail or do you only do online stuff for cancer defeated? Uh, in the market I'm in, direct mail has become very hard to do. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that's information products, in, in particular financial and health newsletters I've mm-hmm. been in most of my life. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's really hard to do. Um, in supplements, you can still do direct mail, but even that is declining. Uh, one leading copywriter, I'm not going to uh, give his name, but he's like one of the most famous copywriters in the country. He told me a couple of weeks ago, direct mail is finished. It's doomed. Mm-hmm. And even though you can still make a lot of money at it, it's finished. So I, I was kind of shocked that he, was, he said that. Do you believe that? Do you think that's true? Um, I think it's always going to be here in some form. Yeah. Uh, what has happened in the markets I'm in, in uh, health information products and supplements, is it, it's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because when everybody uh, stops mailing, the mailing lists aren't there anymore. And the hotline mm-hmm. names aren't there anymore. So, you know, it's like a lifting tide raises all boats, right? So when everybody's mailing like crazy and they're all exchanging lists with one another and everybody's adding new names all the time, the universe of people you have to mail to is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and, And when the cycle is going in the other direction, which it is now in my niche, it's you have the, the reverse of a virtuous cycle. You have a, vi- a vicious cycle, mm-hmm. and so there's just fewer and fewer names. I mean, you can come up with a great direct mail package now, but there's no list like there used to be. Yeah, not, there's not as many lists as there used to be. I kind of think that um, something's got to give because I still read my mail, my snail mail, and mm-hmm. I still look at catalogs. So I, I sort of think there's. There's a way to make this work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just not sure what it is. And I, I'm not doing direct mail anymore myself. Mm-hmm. I'm not in that anymore. It's, uh, it also takes a lot of capital. I mean, you, you've got right. a lot of money on More the street. More expensive, yeah. Yeah, it's very expensive. You've got money on, at, at risk on the street, uh, and it can all be wiped out if a mailing go, heads south. It's, um, Why do you think the, like it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, the cancer defeated, people are more open sharing and it sounds like the nutritional supplement they're not they're more protective would you say it's true um yeah it's probably true um the the list exchange thing is always difficult mm-hmm. um you know it, 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 there's another thing i mean when you're starting out as a new guy and I, I don't know if your listeners some of them are new people trying to get mm-hmm. started if you don't have a mailing list yet you run into this this right. wall where the well, people say yeah, we don't. We can't exchange lists with you because you don't have a list. Yeah, right. so it's hard to get started. You have to find ways to build up your list, and then yeah. you could go and exchange lists with people. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're not necessarily that open. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, it is a quid pro quo. What have you got for me? Right. Uh, right. I mean, you know, one thing I've done um, when I first got started in alternative cancer treatments, mm-hmm. practically nobody else was talking about it. But at the same time, there were several books that were really good, uh, uh, excellent books about alternative cancer treatment. So I was able to go to those guys and kind of deal with them that, hey, I'll market your book. Right. And uh, they didn't know marketing. Uh, so that worked out very nicely. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had some names, too, that I was able to mail their names, and, and that helped me get started. Mm-hmm. So the after Phillips Publishing, what was next? <clears throat> Uh, excuse me here for a moment. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I started my own newsletter company after that. Okay. Uh, and this is financial newsletters. And this was pre-health, pre-alternative was health. Was Philips, you might say. How, what were, the, were they financial and health? Or at that time, were they only financial? When I was there, they were only financial and okay. business to business. Okay. They had some telecommunications newsletters. Uh, the health phase came when I was working later at a company called Agora, which you may have heard of. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, and um, Phillips Publishing, they were starting to experiment with health during my last year there. Mm-hmm. I wasn't involved in it. But they had to muck around with it and kind of experiment for several years and actually spent a lot of money before they hit on a health offer mm-hmm. that became one of the most successful direct mail offers in history. It was for a newsletter called Health and Healing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the direct mail package was written by Clayton Makepeace, mm-hmm. uh, who is a well-known copywriter, mm-hmm. and then later Gary Bensavenga, another genius, got mm-hmm. involved with it. But they just, this was amazing. I mean, after several years of not getting anywhere marketing health newsletters and books mm-hmm. and what have you, 
all of a sudden they had 600,000 subscribers to a newsletter about wow. alternative health because it's just the world was ready. And that was about 1990, I'm thinking, 89. What was the breakthrough, you think? Um, from going uh, from you know nothing kind of fledgling around to 600,000, that's huge. I think they had been working more with mainstream medicine. They were trying to market mainstream health news newsletters. Mm -hmm. And when they started doing alternative health, mm -hmm. it's just there was a market out there for it. And mm -hmm. it was in Clayton Makery's created a tremendous package for them. The ad was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I, I, I think the other thing is the world was just ready. I mean, they were able mm -hmm. to go out and say, you know, if you take this vitamin, you know, your life will change. Right. And it, and it was true. I mean, it, you know, not that many people were taking supplements, and people found out, you know, gosh, when I start taking these vitamins and minerals, I feel great. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't get colds anymore and all this kind of stuff. So <laughs> right, right. It, it really did. It was new. You know, they were the first. There's always, you know, they had a first mover advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, Phyllis Wellishing did. Mm -hmm. uh, so I came into all that later. At Agora, where I was working at the time, we didn't jump on the bandwagon. So, mm -hmm. uh my period at Phillips, and then when I started my own company mm -hmm. following Phillips Publishing, it was all financial newsletters. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was how to invest your money, you know, stocks, bonds, blah, 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 gold, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I had an MBA. I mean, I knew finance. I had a background in that. So I, I knew a little bit about it. Uh, so was it hard to start your own? How did that go? Um, well, I saved, uh, I always wanted to start my own company because I hated having bosses. Mm -hmm. So um, I just really kind of endured three and a half years at Phillips Publishing. Mm -hmm. um, and and I was paid very well. It was The salaries were great. And I just put aside every penny I could so that I had $60,000 in 1982, and that was enough to start a newsletter mm -hmm. with. Right. And it was a lot. It was more money than it sounds like. That was like two hundred fifty thousand dollars equivalent now. Right, right. Uh, no, of it was course. Enough, yeah, it was enough to start a newsletter with. Uh, I was you know, thirty or yeah, I was thirty when I did that. So I, I was young enough to do something crazy, and if it didn't work out, mm -hmm. uh, I would just go back to working for other people. Right. So you know, that's how it was. Uh, the, the great thing about direct mail that I loved about it, going back to the, the, B, the B2B guy in Chicago that I worked for, yeah. um, I saw right away, you know, from my first job in the business that you can do, I could do this. I mm -hmm. could save a little bit of money and start my own newsletter. Anyone mm -hmm. can do this if you know how it's done. Right. Uh, if you know about mailing lists and if you know about stuff like the four free issues offer and mm -hmm. get a refund if you're not happy. And if you know all that stuff, you can do this. Mm -hmm. And having done it for years and, and helped Phil's publishing grow a lot, I knew how much money was required. I knew what the budget was. I knew how you created – I knew about testing. That's important to know. You start small. You test a little bit. And mm -hmm. it, don't, don't risk everything you've got on the first mailing mm -hmm. and things like that. So, you know, just knowing things like that, I was able to get a, a company off the ground. And I was very fortunate. My first mailing I ever did was a success. What was that? Uh, it was for a newsletter called Tax Avoidance Digest okay. about how to reduce your taxes if you're a consumer. So it was a little bit on the, uh, off to the side of the investment newsletter mm -hmm. business. Um, it worked well. I mean, it was nice because all the investment newsletter lists worked for that because mm -hmm. all the people who were investors were also worried about their taxes. For sure. So I was able to mail a tax newsletter. And I didn't, again, I didn't have any competitors. Um, what made you decide I, to do that when most people weren't? Um, I just liked the idea. I thought that a tax newsletter might have a market. There were not very many competitors, not very many people doing it. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed to me that, hey, this was something that a lot of people were concerned about and they'd like to know more about it. How they'd like to, I mean, you know, it has an irresistible sales pitch in a way. I mean, if the, news, the newsletter was only $29 a year for 12 issues, uh, if you cut your taxes by $100, uh, you paid it pays for, for itself. Yeah. Yeah, you paid for itself. And I could easily promise people that I would find a way to reduce your taxes by $100. So um, it had a pretty good uh, basic selling proposition to it. I guess there's a pattern here that, you know, that it really does pay to be the first mover. I mean, in Cancer Defeated, we were really the first to go out and in mass market 
alternative cancer treatments. Nobody mm-hmm. was doing it. It was kind of the third rail that nobody wanted to touch. It's uh, controversial. Fact, it's controversial. Yeah, it was controversial. Yeah, the tax newsletter, I mean, we call it Tax Avoidance Digest, which was kind of in your face. Uh, I got a little bit of flack about that. Why? It's a good uh, name. Everyone well, tax evasion, taxes. You know, it's a legal, it's a fine legal point. Tax evasion is against the law. Well, evasion, you don't call it Tax Evasion Digest. <laughs> yeah, it's not tax evasion. That would be against the law. Right. Tax avoidance is legal. Tax evasion is against the law. Right. So Tax Avoidance Digest was a sort of was signaling people, we're going to go just as far as we can go. Right. without breaking the law. Right. You know, everything we tell you is legal, uh, but it is aggressive. Right. So, um, it's, uh, but, you know, we were among the first. We didn't have a lot of competition on that. So uh, it, it, it can be risky to try something that no one else is doing. Yeah, uh, that's but, why I asked how you decided to do it. Well, fortunately, I never, I've tried a lot of other launches that didn't work that out. That didn't work at that time. That one did. Um, oh, eventually, in the course of that period, um, we tried a, a baby IQ kit. That was a kit that you know you were supposed to raise, you know, ways to raise your your child's IQ. Okay. Yeah. I could see that selling to mom. Yeah, we who, thought who it was a great idea. Raise their, raise their baby's IQ. Yeah, who wouldn't want to do that? We thought it was a great idea. We didn't have to create the kit; somebody else had done that. Right. Uh, we created we created the package for it, and it didn't work. I sort of think that if we maybe we should have plowed more money into it and just like test it, just kept testing, just keep throwing money at it, mm-hmm. because somehow you know people are out there who want this. Yeah, why didn't it work? You think? Um, well, um, I don't know. I mean, it could be a case we were going into a market that we didn't know, mm-hmm. uh, and we didn't know the list in that market. Uh, we didn't know what the hot buttons were that parents were worried about. So there, were, there was a lot we didn't know, and it was just a case of going out on a limb. In that case, somebody saw the limb off. Uh, it, that happened. <laughs> Not a good visual. Um, yeah. So were you writing the copy for the Tax Avoidance Digest, or were, did you have other copywriters? Um, I started out writing the, the direct mail pieces myself, and mm-hmm. then as it became more successful, and you know, as always, when you're in business for yourself, you become so busy you don't have one second. So mm-hmm. I started hiring other copywriters, and you know, I, I had learned the lesson already working for Phillips that you hired the best. Yeah. Uh, the difference between an A-list copywriter and a B-list copywriter isn't fifty percent or twenty-five percent; it's three to one. Well, you know. Yeah. Uh, the best, the best people who who just write copy that the public responds to, they charge a lot. Hopefully, you get it back, though. You get it back. Yeah, they're worth it. You get it back. Yeah. Um, who were musts for you at the time that you wanted to write for you? Uh, the best people at the time were Gary Bensavanga wrote packages for me at that time. Uh, Jim Rutz did. Uh, Clayton Makepeace wrote one or two things for me. They didn't take off, but yeah, that's not his fault that that happened. Um, Jim Rutz wrote, uh, in a way, wrote the package that created the company. I, I wrote the launch packages for Tax Point Digest, but mm-hmm. Jim Rutz came along and wrote uh, a direct mail piece that just went through the roof. It hmm. was, what it was, was it that made it go through the roof? You think? Uh, it's kind of hard to explain unless you have the you have it in front, in front of, you. of you. But there was a cartoon that showed through a glass window on the envelope. The cartoon was the guy being audited by an IRS guy. Mm-hmm. And the IRS guy says, uh, you should be proud to pay taxes, Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith said, I could be just as proud on half the taxes. <laughs> uh, and we have a, you know, it's an old joke. But instead of Mr. Smith, it's you. It's whoever the recipient was. Right, right. So it's personalized. Yeah, you know, so it's you. like your name. Yeah, Mr. White. You know, right. you should be proud to pay taxes. Mr. White right. says, "No, I can be just as proud on half the taxes." Thank you very much. Right. And so it just was. It really worked, and had great copy inside too. Mm-hmm. And you know, and it, it, personalization was new. I mean, it, it, that in those primitive days when it was all mainframe computers. Yeah. This stuff was hard to do and expensive to do, where you sent a letter personalized. Right. Before. We take that for granted when you say that, but at the time, the it's, it had to be yeah. difficult to do that. It was hard to do in those days, yeah. So, yeah, we, and it cost a lot. I mean, that, that doing that package cost a lot, but it, we've got like, I mean, it made a huge amount of money. I was one of the youngest millionaires in the United States, or at least one of the youngest self-made millionaires wow. who had done it himself. Uh, 
so uh, what would the package something like that what would the range cost like because you know you have to make it back or you're kind of up the creek uh, I think in those days, our in-the-mail cost on that was 50 or 60 cents, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's like $1.80 or 2 bucks now, which that's expensive. Uh, I mean, if you were doing direct mail now and, and paying $2 uh, per person to get it out there, that's, mm-hmm. that, that's a lot. So it was expensive to do. What was your process of testing? Like you send it to how many names first, and then if you know you get a certain response, you send it to you know, more? Well, a standard uh, test panel was 5,000 names. Mm-hmm. So whether the list you were testing was 25,000 names or 100,000 names or a million names, you tested a 5,000 random sample, mm-hmm. a random selection from the list. And that's statistically plenty. That's, that gives you all the mm-hmm. statistical significance you're going to get. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, so the returns come back, and then you find out whether you can roll out the rest of the list. Mm-hmm. That's the most exciting day in direct mail is when you do your test, and if the money comes back, then you're calling the list broker and ordering the Quickly. rollout. Right. I mean, see, that was the beauty of direct mail. But you, you, direct uh, Internet is really hard to scale up into big numbers. Um, Direct mail was easy because you could test five lists, uh, 5,000 names each. So you're doing a 25,000 name test. Mm-hmm. Each of those 5,000 uh, tests might have been a sample from a million name list. Mm-hmm. So in theory, you test 25,000 names and you can roll out to 5 million. Right. You, know, you quickly theory. scale it up. Quickly, you can scale up very quickly. And you could make a million, you could really make a million dollars overnight, and a lot of guys did. Well. Uh, Pat Gerard, who I mentioned a moment ago, and a lot of other people. Um, so um, it, it was more scalable, and you know, I'd like. I'm nostalgic for those days when, gosh, you know, you had a successful ad, and you could just call a list broker and order a bunch of lists. Now it's like you have to go to each JV partner, and you know, uh, my biggest partner, the, the biggest media I go to, there's one list we mail to. I think he has six or 700,000 names. That's, that's probably huge. the biggest list. Yeah. Uh, that's the exception. I mean, we're, we're, we're exchanging lists with people who have 20,000 names. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's just really hard to get into big numbers. And the other thing is, uh, you know, your returns. I mean, I, on, on a million Internet email addresses, mm-hmm. your return might be, Probably a tenth of one percent is a really good return. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in 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 direct mail, you got ten times that much, twenty times that much. So return more return. Well, orders. Oh, yeah. orders. Oh, I got per, you. Yeah, per I million you. pieces. Okay. Yeah, the percentage response. The number. Of I return. Response. I got you. I got you. I thought yeah. you meant like return, like refunds. No, 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 okay. no, no, no refunds. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. So were people just mailing in checks at that time? You just get a bunch of. Checks. I was checking credit card. Yeah. It was. It was. Yeah, you, we accepted credit cards. Okay, because at what yeah. point did that become standard? Where people did, because there was a time that people just had to mail checks, right? Uh, yeah, I don't go quite that far back. Uh, when I was doing business, I'm, business I don't mean to date you. <laughs> 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 well, it was uh, in consumer market. Because I remember yeah. talking to Joe Sugarman, and he was like, yeah, we basically started you know, ordering over the phone. I'm like, okay. Yeah, Joe, they. Uh, yeah, Joe would be old enough to remember when you, yeah. you couldn't take Visa and Mastercard. Right. By the time I was around, you could take Visa and Mastercard, yeah. and you had to if you were going to make a success of it. Right. You really had to accept credit card payments. So that revolution, that, and that's one revolution I'm not old enough to remember. Okay. It, it was already in place by the um, time I'm traveling. Um, so with yeah, Joe Sherwin was is a legend, as you know. He's yeah, a, he's legendary. Um, so what about so with your company was there another big milestone or what was next? Um, well, the, the next big milestone was I lost all that money and went out of business after being one of the richest people. What happened? My, <laughs> and so many things went wrong you can't even imagine. I lost a lawsuit and oh, yeah. it, it was with a, a, an editor that I was publishing and it was just uh, it was awful. All kinds of things just went wrong. Um, I had a, a large amount of money was embezzled from me. My accountant. Embezzled. Oh my god! Yeah, it, it, I, it, that's really what brought us down. Is, is there was this horrible embezzlement where we, we lost a huge amount of money. How did you discover it finally? Well, we knew money was missing from the bank account, but he was, he was very de- devious. This is far more common than people realize. And if you're starting a small business, yeah, tell us about it. Uh, people can watch out. 
I would say with small businesses, at least 50% of small businesses are being embezzled from, that this is grammatically very good, but um, if you have a small business, there's a 50-50 chance your, your bookkeeper or your accountant is embezzling from you. Uh, and you just don't know it. Most of them never are discovered because mm-hmm. these guys are very devious, and there's a thousand and one ways uh, to rip off your employer. If you're the accountant and you're sitting in that chair and, and you, you want to do that, um, I mean, one that I learned about, this was years later, mm-hmm. I was in Bethel from again, but fortunately I caught that guy early in the game. But one guy was issuing him, himself credits on Visa and MasterCard. He was issuing himself and his friends mm-hmm. credits on Visa. And um, the, the stupid merchant card company, you would think that if you're issuing someone on a, a credit, they must have, must have been a charge, of course. Right, course. right. They paid you $50, you're issuing them a credit for $50. Right. It didn't work that way. The, the credit card companies were so dumb that they would issue credits to people who had never made a charge. So mm. the, the accountant knew about that. The bookkeeper knew about that loophole. And he was issuing himself and his friends like all these big credits. Wow. Uh, and I didn't know his friends. I mean, I, I, I didn't know their names. They were people I didn't know. Uh, you know, I, I found out that there were all these people I didn't know who were being is, issued quite large credits. And that's how I found it out. This is I'm kind of digressing, but no, you really want to, be, yeah. you want to be very, very careful. If you have a small business, you know, trust no one. I hate to say it, but trust right. no one. You need to be very, very careful and have airtight controls. You should personally sign every check. Don't put somebody else's signature on your checkbook. Don't give out. Don't give other people authority to make disbursements from your checking account. Mm-hmm. You, you, it, it takes time. You have to do it yourself. But you really need to take the time to look at uh, the money that's coming in and out of your company so mm-hmm. you know where, where it is. It's like at 4 o'clock at night, do you know where your money is? It's like, <laughs> you you want to do that. It, it's, you know, be very careful. So what did the guy do? The first guy, you said, was very devious. What, what did he do that was under the radar? Um, we if had, you can talk about it, obviously. It's painful to talk about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a case of me not having tight enough controls. Um, he, we had a, a refund account we, because it was direct mail and it was checks, and we were doing huge volume of you know, selling hundreds of thousands of uh, subscriptions and so forth. Um, we had a special account for which we made refunds, so that we didn't have all those little checks going through our main checking account. Yeah, you know, you were making all these twenty-nine dollar refunds, so there was a special account uh, de- that we dedicated just to making refunds. He was able to manipulate that account. I wasn't careful about looking at out what was going on, or, mm-hmm. you know, keeping an eye on what was going on in that account. Uh, and he was able to use that um, to uh, make transfers of funds to various places. And, That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, would you have suspected with this person's personality at all? Or, you know, it kind of goes uh, into how do you even, like you said, trust big time uh, trust well if you're if you're fairly big if you're an entrepreneur and you're getting big enough to kind of hire a professional bookkeeper or CPA mm-hmm. or something like that I mean you want to have a you want to have a criminal background check done on them mm-hmm. uh, you really want to have that done on anyone who handles money for you I mean we do, I do it here I, I when I hire people mm-hmm. I I have background checks um, and again, I mean, this is going to sound discriminatory, but if somebody owes a lot of money, if you do a background check on somebody and you find out they're deeply that. in debt, that person is not a good risk for a hire because those are the people who get desperate. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of embezzlement starts with the employee being in trouble and they need a few thousand dollars yeah. to get them through the next payday or make the next mortgage payment. Right. And I think that's how a lot of embezzlers get started. Yeah. And then they find out they can get away with it. The next thing you know, they've ripped off a couple of hundred thousand. So how do you pick yourself up from that? Because that's a, that's a really, you know, I kind of hang my head and be like, well, I don't even want to deal with this again. It was, it was like, yeah, you know, uh, it, was, it was a hard time. That was a really rough time. And when the thing like that tests your character. Yeah. Um, you just have to come back. I mean, I was known as a very capable marketer, so I was I got a great job with Agora Inc. Mm-hmm. at the time. Bill Bonner mm-hmm. uh, uh, was uh, still the owner, I guess, and, and was personally running it at that time. So I knew Bill, and he was like happy to hire me and uh, to come in and, and run one of his divisions. So mm-hmm. um, you know, I was eminently employable. That wasn't a problem. Right. At a pretty good salary. So. Uh, 
you know, the bad news is I was back working for somebody else. Right. The good news is um, uh, it was at a, at a good job with a good company. Mm-hmm. Um, Bill is a very smart guy. I mean, I learned, you know, I'd, like I said, you always learn from your competitors. I was working in, I was inside the Kremlin learning right. how those guys did right. things. Maybe it was a good thing. Yeah, and I learned a lot. And um, i uh, that's where I really I came into my own as a copywriter because when I was in business for myself, I had become too busy to write direct mail copy anymore. Mm-hmm. I was selling it all out to people. Uh, mm-hmm. When I was working for Bill, I mean, Bill just kind of laid down the law and said, you are a good copywriter, and that's what I want from you. You're mm-hmm. going to write copy because mm-hmm. you're good at it. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, and I'm, what are you going to say? First of all, he's the boss, <laughs> and he's paying you all his money. <laughs> So, you know, I had, to, I had to write copy again. It was, and I, you know, so I was, I was able to do that. I, I sat down and really looked at it for the first time in several years, uh, as opposed to just outsourcing that job. Right. And I, was, I, I analyzed what people like Gary Bensavenga were doing, what the best people were doing, and I just figured out how to do it and, mm-hmm. and reverse engineered what, uh, what the best people in the business were doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so what did you find I, when you were reverse engineered what they were doing? What did you... If you know a copywriter is listening to this, what advice do you give them? Well, I think that there is uh, they don't do enough work. That's the biggest fault of young copywriters. They don't realize how much work the the greats put into it. Mm-hmm. Um, people like Gary Benzavenga and Clayton Makepeace and Paris Lampropoulos and all these really outstanding copywriters they do an enormous amount of research. They know if, if they undertake to write an ad for you. They learn everything about your product. They learn everything about your your market and its demographics and who those people are. They study what all your competitors are doing. I mean, if they're going to do a package on uh, on cancer, they learn everything about cancer. Mm-hmm. They become an expert in it. So there, there's a massive amount of research. And I, I when I started uh, getting back into that, I realized that's what these guys were doing. Um, uh, and in their ads, the ads were sort of uh, advertorials. They gave away a lot of valuable uh, mm-hmm. information in the ad in mm-hmm. order to hook the customer. So that when the customer was through reading that ad, they, per- they knew, first of all, I'm talking to somebody who knows a lot about this. I could trust this person because right. they know so much. Right. And, um, and then you tease them with what you don't give them. Mm-hmm. You know, you've given them all this really valuable stuff. But then when you get to the, the really important thing, you don't tell them what that is. Mm-hmm. That's what I have to start That's what I hate about your emails. <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> I hate, well, it's a, a love-hate. It's a love-hate. Yeah, it's an important technique. It can't, if you give away everything, they're not right. going to give you any, especially on the Internet. You know, the Internet is a real mentality of getting information for free. So yeah. they're not going to pay you for it if they can possibly help it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but, yeah, that's what I learned back in those days. Um, and I learned, you know, long copy. I mean, at, at the time, copy was just getting longer and longer because everybody was finding that long copy worked. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we finally ended up doing books. We we did little paperback books, 125 pages long. Long, yeah. And stuck those into a six by nine envelope and mailed yeah. them to people. Yeah. Uh, I remember buying was, those things. I bought the doctor's book of home remedies and whatever else was out there. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That. I, I was the second person to do the little book. What did we you call do? Bookalogs. Uh, that was the plague of the Black Dead. Oh yeah, uh, that, that was the most successful direct mail piece I had ever done. Yeah, talk about that. Uh, yeah, it, it was uh, it, it, it was published in 1993. I, I, I must have doubled or tripled Agora's size. I mean, they they will acknowledge that that, that package changed the business. Yeah. Um, but the gimmick was there was this little book, and, and so you told people, "We're giving you this free book. We're giving you a gift. We're giving you a paperback book." Mm-hmm. This was pre-internet; people right. still bought books. Right. So it was like you know you're giving them something valuable, free, uh, right out of the. So they didn't throw it away. Right. So that you overcame problem number one in direct mail, which is everybody throws it all away without reading it. Right. Yeah. They they felt this is too valuable. I can't throw this away, uh, and I. They read it. Uh, it was for some, it, it was an offer for an investment newsletter called mm-hmm. Strategic Investment. Uh, it was about geopolitics. Uh, you know, at the time the Soviet Union had just fallen and all this other stuff. There's mm-hmm. a lot going on in the world. Clinton was president. Blah blah blah. So then we were talking about all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And 
It, it, I don't, it, it sold like 250,000 subscribers. It's amazing. Think, yeah, yeah, $59 each, $79 wow. each, or something like that. It, it created a huge business. Agora promptly did, I don't know how many of these. They, they, did, they were cranking out book logs like crazy because they were so mm -hmm. incredibly successful. Mm -hmm. uh, until just a few years ago, that remained the most successful direct mail pa package Agora had ever done. Uh, they Several years ago, they, they came up with another one, which was on the same theme. It was about a big financial crash. Uh, but um, one of the lessons, I mean, to get people to buy something from you, first give them a gift. This is mm -hmm. uh, a valuable technique for your listeners. Mm -hmm. um, and it's when you do an advertorial or you give people a free report mm -hmm. uh, to get them to opt in, you're using that principle. Right. Um, you know, free report, just give us your email address. Uh, right. <laughs> that's, uh, you're, we'll give you this valuable gift. That's very effective, very powerful. So what else about Plague of the Black Death? I mean, what were the other components of why it worked besides giving a free gift and being a book? I mean, how did you come up with that headline? Well, it's Plague of the Black Debt. It was a, oh, it debt, was debt. Got it, got it. The theme of the package got was it. that the, 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 the uh, national debt of the United States, the federal government's yeah. debts are going to drag us all down. Yes. And... Um, destroy the country eventually. That was, yes. that was what the package was about. Um, so it's upon the plague of the black death yes. it's about this problem, which we laid out for them. It made a very convincing case that uh, I, the country's debts were going to sink us. Uh, we were just 10 years ahead of our time, <laughs> eventually, <laughs> in 15 years ahead, I guess. In 2008, you know, right. it came along that uh, hey, the debts got even worse. Um, but, you know, a lot of people were scared. It was, it was, we were talking to people about something that they were already worried about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there was already uh, a lot of hubbub and concern in the country about runaway indebtedness uh, and the way people, the, the way the country was piling up higher and higher debts and would we ever be able to repay them? Mm -hmm. Will there be money there for me when I want my Social Security, right. you know? Uh, are my treasury bonds safe, or will the government yeah. default on you know all this kind of stuff? Uh, so, I mean, how did you, you know, know? Did you do like? Obviously, you said research is a huge component. Did you call people up? How did you find out what was going on inside people's heads? Uh, we knew what was going on inside their heads because the previous year, in 1992, there had been a presidential election, and there was a third-party candidate named Ross Perot, mm -hmm. and he and his whole campaign was about the dangers of the national debt and how mm -hmm. this is going to destroy the country. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he did very well. He, 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 he cost, he, it was because of Ross Perot that the first George Bush was not reelected and Clinton got into the White House. So everyone had been brought up to speed on this mm -hmm. problem. The whole, country, the whole country was concerned about it. And there were also a couple of New York Times best-selling books about this very problem. Mm -hmm. So we knew that this was on people's minds. Mm -hmm. And it was just a matter of, of hitting that hot button. I mean, similarly, years later, a few years later, um, or actually, I guess it was a few years before, it was the same way that somehow Phillips Publishing came out with that alternative health thing at just the right moment when there were a lot of people who were just ready for that. Uh, luck does play a, a part in life. You know, mm -hmm. you have to talk to people about what they're worried about at the time they're right. worried about it. Right. Um, so, um, you know, we just hit that right. I mean, there was enormous worry about the country going down the tubes. Mm -hmm. As I, you know, Like I say, they were worried about it 15 years too soon, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, they responded like crazy. That, that The whole thing was a huge success. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the mere concept, I mean, aside from the contents of the book, just the mere idea of giving a free book away mm -hmm. turned out to be such a powerful idea that, that uh, Agora was able to run with it. Mm -hmm. Um, so when did Cancer Defeated come in the picture? Uh, Cancer Defeated was started in 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to give you an inspiring story about how someone I love died of cancer and it inspired me to go out and find a Hopefully cure. Hopefully that'd be less. Yeah. We, don't yeah. end, we don't end dying because of Cancer Defeated. but <laughs> Yeah. Now, the reality is, is, is a friend of mine uh, named John Finn approached me and said, had this idea of mm -hmm. let's publish a book about alternative cancer treatments, mm -hmm. uh, so we did, and that was in 2005. Uh, it was called Natural Cancer Remedies That Work, and it was about 
the 10 best remedies as far as our research could indicate at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it did well, and you know, we decided to do another one. So, we how did you get the word out at that time? Um, we knew we were able to get access to mailing lists, um, like Agora's uh, email list, for example. Mm-hmm. Agora had pioneered the idea of using a free online newsletter as a lead generator for either uh, an investment business or a health business. Mm-hmm. And they had huge circulation. They had millions of names of people who had opted in on the Internet to receive a free newsletter. Mm-hmm. And Agora was the first to do that. So, And they have been doing that for several years when we came along in 2005. But we were able to work a JV deal with them where they would run our ads for this cancer book, and we would split the, the revenue 50-50. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, and they were happy. They were making enough money, and we were making enough money. So... Mm-hmm. Um, it worked out. So that got us off the ground. We yeah. had to, it pays to have a friend. Uh, yes, it does. Yeah, we were able to approach somebody and, and get them to... I'm sure people. you knew everyone there. I did. Yeah, I did. We, I had the connections, and so did John Finn. Uh, your network of JV friends is very important. Uh, the people who will do a deal like that with you, uh, in, on, if you're on the Internet, uh, especially if you're, if you're a startup and you're trying to get off the ground, um, you know, it really pays to have a couple of people who like mm-hmm. you and will let you have a crack at their mailing list. Mm-hmm. And it can pay. I mean, we, we did a 50-50 split. It can pay to give the other guy 75% or even 100% of the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, Just to build your list. To build your list, yeah. So what did you do next after natural cancer remedies that work? What did you decide to do next? Well, the next one was a book about alternative cancer clinics in Mexico because a lot of people... You have to go to Mexico to get certain treatments because mm-hmm. they're illegal in the United States. Like what? Uh, well, there's one called Laetrile, which mm-hmm. is uh, it's a natural cancer remedy. It's, yeah, it's that's an apricot seed, right? It's an apricot seed extract. It gets mm-hmm. it present in other plants, too, but it's, uh, apricot seeds have a lot. So it, it, the best way to get it is uh, it's, it's an extract that is purified and then given intravenously. Hmm. You, it's very hard to get in the United States. It's next to impossible. So mm-hmm. there are these Mexican clinics who offer Laetrile, and a variety of other treatments right. uh, that you can't get here. Hyperthermia is one um, that you you can't get here, very, or at least not very easily. So we did a guide to all these Mexican cancer clinics. So we went down and, and toured the clinics and talked to the doctors and talked mm-hmm. to patients who had gone there to see if they got well and things like that, and then did a report on it. Uh, so that was a book. And uh we just started doing a series of books about alternative cancer treatments. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did one about German alternative cancer clinics. Uh, we hooked up with, a, as I mentioned earlier, we, we found a couple of people who were publishing their own books about cancer and didn't know much about marketing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we cut a deal with them to market their books. Uh, so it just kind of grew from there. I mean, cross-selling is really important, uh, especially, I think, on the Internet. Um, well, you know, when, well, probably anywhere. Once you've sold them the first thing you've sold them, whatever that may be, mm-hmm. or once you've collected their name and you've got their email address with a lead generation program, you got to have something else to sell them. The more mm-hmm. things you have to sell them, the better off you are. So, you know, it's very important to have a bunch of different products that you can sell people, uh, related products. Right. Uh, you know, we found that with cancer... Um, if someone is a cancer patient or if they're taking care of a loved one who has cancer, uh, they will buy four or five books about cancer treatment. Right. Yeah, they're, they're buy all of them. Yeah, yeah, they'll buy all of them. We have a lot of people who bought at least a couple, three, and sometimes every book we publish. Yeah. Uh, Unless it's like they, the they, they need information. They're yeah. looking for uh, as much information as they can get. Um, so, yeah, we were able to profit from that. Yeah. It, it was the whole cross-selling thing of... Uh, get them in and then have other things that they'll be interested in mm-hmm. and we started the newsletter i mean what they the free newsletter i mean we saw what agora was doing uh with these huge lists of of newsletter subscribers getting a free newsletter and we wanted to do that uh we had to, we, we started out with the books however and once we we had a little bit of income and cash flow and and some and a mailing list then we started the free newsletter uh and the free newsletter has been very successful. It's called Cancer Defeated, as you mentioned at the beginning mm-hmm. of the call. Uh, that's, that's been great. But you have a paid news, but isn't it paid too? 
No, uh, Cancer Defeated is free. Anybody can opt in. Just go to cancerdefeated.com uh, and opt in, and you can get our newsletter. It's two times a week. Mm-hmm. Um, then once we got going, we also started generating leads. We went out and did various things to just opt. Instead of selling people something, just get them to opt into the newsletter. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you know, making leads profitable is it takes patience. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to have a model. You have to have you have to have a plan to turn a lead into money. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just you know, your listeners will want to be aware of that. But. Um, it's it's a good business to be in. I mean, what the newsletter has become very important to us now. It, it started out as just kind of a goodwill tool mm-hmm. to, so that we had a relationship with our people and we were in communication with them. But every newsletter has an ad in it, um, so it's a it's a revenue source. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, our philosophy on newsletters is a lot of people get, send a newsletter every day. You know, you buy a toy on the internet for a nephew or your kids. Mm -hmm. And then you start getting a toy newsletter every day. Mm -hmm. Right. Who wants a toy newsletter every day? I mean, you know, we, we, we have a cancer alternative cancer treatment newsletter. We send it twice a week because our reasoning is, come on, you know, they don't love us so much that they really want to read about this every day. (laughs) Twice a week is enough. (laughs) And we have a sharp distinction between the editorial and the ad. Right. In our newsletters, the ad is the ad, and the editorial copy is objective yeah. editorial copy. Yeah. We don't mix them two. I see. You know, so you get a lot of newsletters where the newsletter is really an ad. It's mm-hmm. all editorial. Right. I, to me, I... You like that distinction there. I, I, you know, I'm old-fashioned. I mean, that was always a rule in journalism that you, the editorial and, and the ad department were on opposite sides yeah. of the wall. It's not like the fine print at the top, like, this is a paid advertisement and the whole thing's... In advertisement is a very distinct. This is the, you know, the bulk information, and then here's the ad type of thing. Yeah, we keep a distinction. I mean, you know, and we will plug our products in our ads. Like if we have an ad about, if, we're, if we write a newsletter article about Laetrile, we'll say, you know, the best place to get Laetrile is the Mexican cancer clinics because they'll do it intravenously, and that's the best way to do it. And mm-hmm. and we have a book about alternative cancer treatments mm-hmm. or about Mexican clinics. So, you know, get our book about Mexican clinics and you'll learn the best places to go for Laetrile. I mean, that's legitimate because you're making it clear that it's a book and you're selling something. Mm-hmm. You know, it, but the, we don't, the article is not a disguised ad. And that's, right. that's, I don't do it that way. We have a, the majority of our articles, in fact, don't sell one of our products. They are pure information mm-hmm. that's completely objective. Um, so that's my philosophy on newsletters. Don't, people don't want one from you every day or twice a day. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you give them good, objective, valuable information, and and not just try to constantly be selling them. Mm-hmm. Lee, what's so, one of the most shocking things you discovered from your cancer research that works like alternatively? Because I'm sure you oh, come like, across crazy things all the oh, time. Oh, yeah, all kinds of yeah. crazy work. I mean, the mind over matter stuff actually works. Uh, there are um, mental exercises, and there are books and courses that you can you can purchase. And, and that, What's your bestseller that people should check out? Oh gosh, uh, you know our bestseller is a book called "How to Cure Almost Any Cancer uh, at Home for Five Dollars and Fifteen Cents a Day," hmm. and it's real short. It's a short book. It's very basic. I mean, it's really for people if you don't have the money to go to a clinic and you can't afford a doctor, and you're you know. You can do these things at home, and they're very inexpensive. It's only five dollars mm-hmm. and fifteen cents a day, mm-hmm. and they work a lot. You can do these things, and a lot, and it turns it around for a lot of people, even even people with late stage cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been our best. That's that's been probably our best selling book, and people just love it. How to cure almost any cancer at home for five dollars and fifteen cents a day. Mm-hmm. What's um, another? I know we're um, we have a few minutes left. I could probably uh, this can go for hours, but. Um, what is uh, with this a big milestone that you think would be important to share with Cancer Defeated that we haven't talked about yet? An important milestone. Yeah, it was a lesson or, milestone. Hmm. Um. Well, I think for us it was well. They did it, it, the VSLs were a game changer. Mm-hmm. You know, they're old news now, but at the time they occurred, 
they 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 yeah. doubled our business. They they were a game changer, mm-hmm. and they and they doubled a lot of other people's business too. I mean, that was the point where uh, people started sharing lists a lot more. The lists started getting bigger, and people mm-hmm. started sharing mailing lists. It mm-hmm. was that virtuous cycle that mm-hmm. I told you about earlier. You know, you want to be in a growth market where mm-hmm. the lists are getting bigger and there's more lists all the time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and the VSL has kind of brought that about in, in this niche. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wish that somebody would, would think up whatever the next VSL is going to be. What's the next big thing? <laughs> what will double my business next? Yeah, what will double my business next? What's the <laughs> technique, the marketing technique that's yeah. going to do that? And I know it's out there. Uh-huh. I, I don't know what it is, but it's out there. Yeah. So, Lee, since it's Inspired Insider, I want you to just talk for a few minutes about two things. One, that lowest point and how you push forward what you're thinking mentally to get over that low point. And then two, what, what the proudest moment has been in your career so far? Uh, well, the proudest moment is easy. I get these letters from, I, I tear up, <laughs> I should have started talking about this. Yeah. People write letters that, that they've recovered from cancer. And, and yeah. You know, it, I, I can't put it into words. What's one that you got that was especially touching? Well, we've gotten a lot of them. I, you know, I can't even single out one. We get mm-hmm. one every week or two from mm-hmm. somebody that's mm-hmm. like, I got your newsletter, I did this, I've gotten well. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it's really amazing. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I really don't need money anymore. I could retire, I'm old enough to retire, but yeah. um, it it's, keeps you going. Yeah, but the work is worthwhile. And if I had to advise anybody on something, it would be to, to do something that, that means something to you. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's really important to, to uh, excuse me here. Yeah. It's really important that, that your work means something to you because yeah. being a service to other people is, is the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, and you have to incorporate, I mean, to really get this to the masses you have to like we said you have to really hone in on good copy and making sure people see the you know or they're not going to buy it right yeah well i know they know when you're fake yeah they they see through that yeah. no, i don't know how it is i mean it's amazing i've been in this business for 40 years and yeah. i've marketed guys who were jerks because you know i'm if you're a direct mail copywriter you're gun for hire and you know sometimes you know you get a client or, or an editor or whatever. The product is phony. The guy is a jerk. Mm. It's amazing, but the public sees through that. I yeah. mean, you can write the best copy that you could ever write. You can have Gary Benzavang, a great, great package. And somehow the public knows these guys. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. They sense authenticity. Mm-hmm. So the easiest thing to do is just don't bother. Just be authentic. You know, mm-hmm. Don't try to fool people. Right. You know, Be real. Be authentic. Do something worthwhile. Be a service to people. You know, you know, pick something that will make you money and, and will support your family, but that means something and is a service to people. Yeah. And do that and be real and don't lie. Yeah. You know, it's like it, the Google motto, you know, don't be evil. They unfortunately don't follow their own motto anymore at Google. But <laughs> it's still a good model, a, yeah, motto, don't be evil is good advice right. Right, that I would urge on people. Right. Yeah, the low point is also easy. That's when I went bankrupt. I mean, professionally, yeah. that was the lowest point in my yeah. career. I mean, it was it was a nightmare. It was it was the, the one of the two worst things that ever happened to me in my life. It was like a death in the family, yeah. and that's a really hard thing to get through. And you know, religious faith made a big difference. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, the sun rises again tomorrow. Yeah. It's it's like the Hemingway title, the sun also rises. You know, yeah. however dark it may be now, you know, the sun's going to come up again. Yeah. And it really pays to persevere. And in that case, you know, when that happened to me, at the, at the end of a journey that lasted a couple of years, you know, I had to get back into writing direct mail copy, which I didn't want to do because it's really, really hard. Right. And, uh, you know, I became uh, the best, one of the best direct mail copywriters in the country. I became famous because of that. Yeah. So, you know, bad things turn out to be a good thing. And right. usually that's the case. You yeah. know, it's what it's, you don't know what God's plan for you is. And mm-hmm. you just, just sometimes you just kind of have to roll with it yeah. and uh, find out. <laughs> Lee, you're fantastic. I really appreciate you doing this. And um, where should people check it out, check you out online? Where should we send them? Um, you can send them to uh, to 
cancerdefeated.com. Okay. And if they want to write me, they can write newsletter at cancerdefeated.com. Okay. And yeah. I personally, that's my mailbox. Yeah. And I'll take a look. Thank you. No, this looking is, forward to hearing from your folks. This is great. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I enjoyed it. It was, it was fun. I'm glad you had fun. I was hoping. It, it was, yeah. I was a little, uh, a little uh, ambivalent about it, but it turned out to be a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you, Lee. I really appreciate it.